Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 7. We took a two-week uh, break away from our study through Mark, and if you remember, the last time we were in Mark was in the first verses of chapter 7. Uh, and we looked at how the Pharisees tried to ambush Jesus. There's no, no kind way to say it. They, they watched, the scripture tells us they were watching, thinking they caught him in something. They caught his followers not washing their hands ceremonially before they ate. They caught them doing things that were not supposed to be done on the Sabbath. They thought they had him. Jesus seized the opportunity, of course, if you remember that passage in verses 1 to uh, 13, to point out to them their own hypocrisy. That they were basically trying to pick out a speck in the eye of Jesus and his disciples when they had a log in their eye. He didn't use that analogy then, but he would use it later on. Today we move forward and you find out as we're going forward, he's really not finished talking about that. And Mark 7, verses 14 to 23, I want us to look for a few minutes at the real source of our defilement. If you've had that, found that in your Bibles, uh, and if you don't have your Bible, we've got it on the screen for you. Stand with me as I just I read this text as we get into what one writer called the most radical statements Jesus ever made. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. We need to pay close attention to this, because what have we just read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. God, help us today to avoid the pitfall of Phariseeism, of legalism, and experience the beauty and the joy of, and fullness of real, heartfelt Christianity. Thank you. Be seated. Well, he turned the tables on them, remember? And you get the sense in verses 1 to 13 that he was speaking maybe primarily to them, though others could have been listening, but he was, he was, they approached him with the accusation, he unmasks their hypocrisy. But this, this passage here, Jesus throws it into another gear, a higher gear. As our text tells us, he called the people to him again. Come, I want to tell you something. They may have been eavesdropping earlier because what he was saying was not directed specifically at them, it was directed to the Pharisees, but now he wants to make sure that they understand what he's about to say is for, for their ears to hear. In fact, you'll notice in the English Standard Version, which I use, the ESV, it leaves out the 16th verse. There's some question about the, about the textual uh, integrity of that. I, I inserted it because it's in other, other uh, versions of Scripture. If you have ears to hear, listen up. And so, what he's going to say, we read it and we just read right over it. But if you could have heard it with Jewish ears, it would have been one of the most incredible. You were a bit of crossroads. Either this man is a complete fraud and blasphemer or he is a prophet who has brought a word that they've never heard before. Those, those are the only options you have when he says it. So I want us to see there's just two things today. First, the source of our defilement is stated generally, verses 14, 16. And then second, the source of our defilement stated more specifically where, where he's going to 
go into the house and his disciples say, we think we heard what you said, but we're not sure we heard what you said. Can you explain? Can you expound upon that, please? Let's look at it together. The source of our defilement stated generally in verses 14 to 16, he calls the people to him. Hear me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Nothing outside, for, for crying out loud, these people have been taught since they were, since they were infants that there are certain things you don't touch, you don't, there are certain things you don't put your lips to, there are certain things you don't eat, you don't consume, because to do so is to put you in a defiled state, it's to put you really to separate you from God, it's to, it's to bring down the wrath of God upon you, it's to call into question your sincerity in following God. There was a whole list of these kinds of things. In fact, the passage we read together in Acts 10 was Peter's wake-up call. These are Peter's memoirs, remember. Mark is writing for us, as best we understand, what Peter told him to write about the gospel. So we're going to get this editorial comment in a, in a few minutes in this passage where Peter wants Mark to be sure to write down, by doing this, he declared all foods clean. Peter was not writing this as he went because he had to experience that himself in Acts 10 where Cornelius was on the way and the sheet is dropped down and it's filled with the animals that the Old Testament Levitical law says you do not eat these. You are separate people. You do not eat the way the Gentiles eat. There are certain dietary restrictions for Jews. And Jesus wants to press home the point he's made. He's, he's called the Pharisees hypocrites because they circumvent the law. They really, don't, they really don't have the admiration for the law that they pretend to have. And Jesus has basically called them uh, in, the, in the first portion, verses 1 to 13, antinomians. They, they, they act against the law. Here he's going to press upon the people with the Pharisees present, we imagine, that they are legalists. In this one statement, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. It's stated negatively. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. That's, that's the positive statement of a, of a terrible reality. Jesus would call the Pharisees at one point unclean cups. Their, their cups washed on the outside and they're filthy on the inside. He would call them at another point uh, whitewashed tombs or sepulchers. They're, they're uh, painted up tombs, but inside is death. On the outside, they might look attractive. On the inside is death. And he's driving home this point. And this is what I, I, want, us to, I want us to take this in today. It's not, it's not what we do or, or abstain from. It's not, it's not what we drink or don't drink, eat or don't drink, this is not what makes us vital Christians. In fact, those things just become matters of liberty, of taste, of hygiene. But they don't, the abstinence from, participation in doesn't make a person more spiritual. And we've got to grasp that, folks. I was raised in a climate, they were, they were sincere, but the notion I was raised in was there's just certain things you don't do, certain things you don't participate in, certain things you don't put into your mouth, into your system, because, well, because I was a Baptist. That was basically what, you know. And this is not, this is not a license to go out and do things that you have, that you have refused to do through your life. In other words, it's not, it's not advocating. It's not advocating uh, smoking, drinking, doing drugs. It's not advocating that. What it is saying is the abstinence of that does not make one necessarily a true follower of Jesus. I'm going to commend to you a book. It's by a man named Gardner Spring, G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R -E Spring. You can find it on the Internet. In fact, you can go to gracegems.org, and the book is there. It's called Distinguishing Characteristics of a Christian. 
And he has seven, I think, seven things. He says that the, the presence of these things does not prove or disprove that you're a Christian. And I promise you, if you'll read that little book on the internet, it'll do surgery on you. Then he gets beyond that, and I think there's about 11 things. He says, now these things, the marks of these things in a person's life do, do prove the presence of the Spirit in the life of one who is a true follower of Jesus Christ. So there's this general principle stated here. It was earth shattering. Look at the second portion over here. We're told verse 17, when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Uh, can you go over that one more time? Did we, did we think we heard what you said, but did you really say Because we know the Pharisees were fussing at you because we, we were eating on the way and we did not participate in ceremonial washings that we're supposed to do. Did you really say that doesn't matter? Help us here. So Jesus said then, verse 18, then are you also without understanding? Is, in other words, I'm teaching, the, the people are hearing the word in the original they're taking it in in their ears, but they're not understanding. It's, it's, not, it's not moving to shape the mind and grip the heart. Folks, we hear a lot of things that we don't understand. We hear a lot of things that we don't not heed. In fact, there's a, there's a way in the Greek where it distinguishes between hearing, the auditory nerves take in sound, and then that word is taken and, and intensified, and it means to here under, to hear with a view to obeying. Jesus simply says here, are you also without understanding? You, you walk with me every day. I teach you every day. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Now I preached on this years and years ago, 30 years ago I think, and a, and a parent came to me after and said, you you just gave my teenage daughter a green light to drink. I said, no, I didn't. That's not, I wasn't preaching on that. Your teenage daughter's got some hurdles to clear. First of all, she's your daughter. <laughs> the fifth commandment really rides high in her life of permissions. Also, she's not of the age. It'd be illegal for her. So don't miss what I'm saying. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying any more than Jesus is saying. Jesus got himself in hot water because of this, by the way. He says, now how, here's his reason. Since, verse 19, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Certain foods. And they, they for, forbade the, the eating of uh, shellfish. Oh, that's awful. I grew up in southeast Texas. I was a pastor in Louisiana for a long time. I love me some shrimp and I love me some crawfish. And I'm glad that these things have fallen by the wayside, these Old Testament restrictions. It's one area that I don't struggle sinning about. Now, the quantities that I'm able to eat, that's a different discussion. But, but the, eating those is okay. Because it's simply, Jesus said it just goes in. It goes into the stomach. It's, it's drawn on for nourishment, and it's expelled. That may seem crude to you, but that's, he's just saying that's the extent of it. And Peter makes sure that Mark adds a parenthesis here. Thus he declared all foods clean. which set them at opposition and at odds with the entire Judaistic structure. And it set before them something that years and years of teaching and practice had drilled into their hearts and minds, that this is something you just don't do. We, we don't, we're Jews, we don't do that. But look what's happening here, folks. Jesus, as he did in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthews 5, 6, and 7, he internalizes the law. You've heard it said, 
Don't murder, but I tell you, if you hate somebody in your heart, you've murdered them. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you, if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus internalizes the Ten Commandments because, you see, the gospel is first and foremost internalized. Paul says in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then he flips it. Four, it's with the heart that a person believes and is justified, and it's with the mouth confession is made to salvation. What he's saying there is it starts in the heart. And the evidence of it is when it comes out the mouth, confessing Christ. Jesus is teaching that here. Verse 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. What comes out is what our problem is with sin. It all starts in the heart. Brothers and sisters, two people, two people never had to go through adolescence, never had to go through puberty, never had to struggle with any of those things. Two people were placed fully grown, fully mature in some place we call paradise, in Eden. There was nothing around them. It was beautiful there. And in the midst of the perfect environment, their hearts, when Eve saw, when she was willing to listen to the, to the serpent lie about God, from her heart, started in the heart. That's where it starts with you and me. Self-control has got to take over the heart. Look at this. Verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of man, come this list of things. Evil thoughts, really, some, some believe that evil thoughts is sort of the, the overarching term. And the rest of these are expressions of evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. It's the word, the Greek word, pornia. You hear pornography in that, don't you? Pornography starts in the heart. The longing for that. It's a, it's a broad class of all kinds of immorality. It's a violation of the seventh commandment. Theft. Violation of the eighth commandment. Murder. The Sixth Commandment. Adultery, the Seventh Commandment. Coveting, the Tenth Commandment. Wickedness. Bad conduct. Deceit, the Ninth Commandment. Don't lie. Sensuality. There's several, several words in here that speak of the, of the fleshly lust that we deal with. And it's not just sexual lust. It's not just lust after, after people it can be lust after possessions, lust after power, lust after things. Slander, evil speaking of someone. Pride, which goes before the fall, before destruction. Foolishness. Folly, which the, which the book of Proverbs just ransacks the danger of folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile us. Brothers and sisters, how are we going to how are we going to fight this defilement? It shouldn't surprise us, by the way, that Jesus speaks this way, because again in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, chapter five of Matthew, verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Get the point. The observance of external rules does not correct the nature of the heart. In fact, Jeremiah 17.9, the prophet warned that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You have know that list, remember in Romans 3? 10 to 18, that's, that's none is righteous, no, not one. And it goes through and describes 
what, what unrighteous people look like. It's, it's a passage that, one of those passages that teaches us total depravity. We're studying that uh, in our, one of our uh, life group gatherings on Sunday evening, looking at total depravity. Not the idea that everyone's as bad as he can be, it's just that we're, we're, we're permeated with sin before we come to Christ. Everything about us is stained so that our good works have wrong motives before we come to Christ. That's why, that's why Isaiah the prophet would say, your righteousness, that is your, your own idea of your goodness, is, is filthy rags before God. The, the, the great uh, first great awakening preacher, George Whitfield, said when we come to the Lord, we must repent of our sin nature, that we are by nature sinners. We must repent of our sins, the, the actual sins we are guilty of by committing them or sins we're guilty of by leaving things undone, omitting. And then he said, and we must repent, thirdly, of our righteousness. Of the idea that somehow in us dwells something that God will take into account to be a positive in our relationship with him. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. I've given you that picture before this in Romans 3.23. One of my professors in the seminary years ago said, now to get the, f the force of falling short of, he said, suppose I gave you a bow and an arrow. And I said, now there's the target. I want you to come as close as you can to that target. But wait, before you shoot, turn. Now shoot. He said, that's the emphasis of the word here. It's falling short. Is that we don't just, it's not like we hit a nine instead of a ten. We're totally off the mark. Paul himself would say, even as a believer in Romans 7, 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He was simply, honestly assessing his remaining sin, the battle with sin. This is not, this is not a downer. You see, if we become convinced that in me dwells no good thing that I can bring to God and say, what about this, Lord? If I can come to that point, then I come to the end of myself and I look and find what we sang about, this mercy we, we sang about. As endless as the sea. Mercy reigning at the cross. But I've got to get to the end of myself. I've got to recognize that, that it's not what my hands have done or not done. Not what my mouth has touched or not touched. What, not what has ta taken into my body or not. That's not what qualifies me or disqualifies me because we're all by nature disqualified. So real quickly, what do we need? We need a radical new birth. A radical new birth is way beyond a decision. Just like Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born a second time, I was visiting with a fellow this past week and just talking with him about the situation. And walking, he was walking through his life, and I said, well, you need to be born again. He said, well, I was born again back when I was a teenager, but, but then the, the description of his life, there was nothing radical about it. What he called being born again was some decision he made that did not radically change him. So there's got to be a radical new birth that's accompanied by a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26, the new covenant. The prophet Ezekiel said, speaking for God, I will give them a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Thirdly, there must be a resurrection. That means for us that something must have died in us and something been brought to life. Romans 6, 3 and 4 talks about that in verse 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too would walk in newness of life. And finally, there must be a new creation. Radical new birth, new heart, a resurrection, a, re a new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, there's the new has come. Doesn't mean that, that when we're saved that all sin is eradicated. Justification, coming, coming to faith in Christ, does not eradicate all sins. It simply 
settles the issue of sin between us and God so that we are, we are forgiven, we're delivered from the penalty of our sins. We're involved, if, if that happens, we're involved in ongoing sanctification. We are being continually delivered from the power of sin. If you've, if you've been a Christian six months, you should be able to look back and say, you know, there was, there was this in my life, and I'm, the Lord has helped me to subdue it. It's not the issue. Now, there is another issue that's been brought up, but this issue is being, you see, as you grow in grace, there are things that you overcome. And the Lord basically says, okay, the Spirit has that under control. You're yielding to the Spirit. Let me show you something else. And he opens the door and you go, oh, my goodness. And then you've got to deal with that too. But it's happening. It's progressing. A new creation. A new creation. Is that your story? Is that your story? I once was dead in trespasses and sins. The Lord made me alive, he brought me from death to life. He, he brought me from being not born again to being born again. Repentance was my cry, faith was my expression in Christ. I've been given a new heart, I made a new creation, a new attitude. I still battle with sin, but the, the emphasis on the, is on the word battle, I still battle. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. See, let me close with this. Christianity is truly an inside-out reality. That's what Jesus was saying to his followers. Don't start like the Pharisees who start on the outside and think that what they do on the outside changes the inside. It's an inside-out reality. You start with receiving Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. That's an inside experience that works itself outside. Works yourself out. None of these legalistic things. And by the way, brothers and sisters, you know, there are things you ought to avoid. They're, they're bad for your health. They won't help you to have a good witness. But you avoid them. Here's the difference. The things that we avoid, we do so because of the, what's happening on the inside that's working itself outside. We don't avoid these things because we think by doing so, it changes our inside. It doesn't. It's a subtle but very real difference. We've got to understand that the heart of our problem is the problem of our heart. The problem of concerning our heart. We have to have a new heart. When we have a new heart, then our, we, our mind is made new, begins to be renewed. Our chooser is fixed. We choose those things that are good for us and glorify God. I want you to feel today as we go. Be keenly aware of the subtlety of Phariseeism and the fact that the Lord looks on the heart. Again, Gardner Springs book. Distinguishing characteristics of the Christian. GraceGems.org, you can find it there. Use that to exam examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. The scripture tells us to do that. I want you and me to cultivate the habit of examining our hearts and guarding our hearts. Practicing self-denial and practicing repentance when ungodly thoughts, emotions, wants, and desires begin to arise. I told someone this week, Karen and I married, God willing, 42 years this June. And it's been a 41-year journey of recognizing that I am a sinner saved by grace. And that she is a sinner saved by grace. And then when I sin against her, I need to repent. And she needs to forgive me. And when she sins against me, she needs to repent. And I need to forgive her. That, that has been the journey. And that is what makes it so sweet and so wonderful. It's to see the gospel at, at work. To see the gospel driving the train. That's what keeps me from trying to, quote, fix her. And what keeps her from trying to fix me the gospel. 
Jesus died and rose again, a truth that must be embraced in our inmost being, the seat of our, of our motives, and work itself out. I hope that's happening in you. I believe it is for many of you here, but I know it's not for all of you. And it, for, <laughs> Look unto Jesus. Take him at his word. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, he says, I will never turn away. Come to Jesus Christ in your heart right now and begin the journey of that inside-out experience we call Christianity. Let's pray.